You know it. We know it. Next year is creeping up quick. If you want to win inside your niche in 2024, you need tech that puts you in the pilot seat. The new HubSpot Sales Hub will help you close out the year strong and kickstart your success for 2024. Teams can collaborate on every inch of the customer journey and keep operations running smoothly with a comprehensive prospecting workspace and powerful sales analytics tools that keep data connected across teams. They'll help you whip up assets and execute tasks that used to take hours out of your workday. HubSpot Sales Hub lets you accelerate every facet of your sales operation with precision. And with over 1,400 integrations, there are tons of ways to mix in new features. So finish out Q4 strong and gear up for the new year with HubSpot Sales Hub. Learn more at HubSpot.com slash sales. Good morning, everyone. It's Thursday, August 3rd. I'm Ben Berkeley here with Juliette bennett Ryla and Lestrandra Alfred. And this is the Hustle Daily Show. Today, we're going to talk about an entrepreneur whose four-year-old apparel brand just closed a $270 million fundraising round, valuing this company at $4 billion. And yes, we're talking about Kim Kardashian. But first, let's catch you up on what else is happening around the world of business and tech. Let's start in China, where the nation's internet regulator announced plans to curb teen phone usage with a two-hour daily internet limit for 16 to 18-year-olds. And they're also blocking teens' mobile internet access between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. And if there's one thing I think we all know about teens, they're going to just love this and go right along with it and won't find any way around this. (laughs) (laughs) We do have one other story out of China today. So in May, cryptocurrency exchange Binance reportedly facilitated $90 billion of crypto trading in China. However, that's been against the law in the country since 2021. So that's a little bit troubling. And, you know, I think that there's also trouble for the company in the U.S. where regulators are weighing fraud charges against the exchange. So really, really tricky time for Binance. Meanwhile, Ferrari zoomed past its financial goals in Q2. Its profits are up 33% year over year. And the automaker's customers are opting for more personalized features. The company looks to do about $6.4 billion of revenue this year. I feel like anytime you see a car company doing earnings, you can either say it's zoomed past, it has raced past (laughs) uh, its expectations. I've seen that with the box office a lot. It'll be like the Little Mermaid swims up to Evil Dead scares up. (laughs) Like... It's always got to be a fun verb. I literally just saw a headline that said the haunted mansion spooks the box office, which I thought was pretty funny, seeing as how that movie didn't perform very well. No, it did not. It really didn't. Well, let's get into something else kind of scary, which is Microsoft Teams' new spatial audio features for video calls, which will allow you to kind of hear your colleagues' voices physically spread out in your room based on their screen position. Are we, are we excited about this? Absolutely not. It is giving Oz vibes, and I don't like <laughs> the sound of that at all. Yeah, and I, I feel like this is also just like a thing that's, that people are really into right now. I, that, was, that was one of the big hyped features of Apple's Vision Pro. Yeah, it's really cool in gaming or like in some sort of immersive experience, but I don't think we need that in meetings. That's too much. You know, let virtual meetings be virtual meetings. And then finally, before we get to Kim Kardashian, we're going to talk about another star, I think. This is YouTube's biggest creator, Mr. Beast, who is suing a ghost kitchen company for serving gross food. He launched Mr. Beast Burgers as a restaurant through virtual ghost kitchens. And now this ghost kitchen, which is virtual dining concepts, they're claiming Mr. Beast is bullying them because he wanted more money out of the partnership. Yeah, I am really interested in this one, actually, because the allegations are that like some of the burgers were not cooked properly or or they were raw or the food just wasn't made properly or was using poor quality ingredients. And I think that'll be an interesting thing about ghost kitchens because they are by nature like kind of all different. Like I don't I don't know that they have the strict rules in place that like a, a franchise like McDonald's or something would have. So 
I'm interested to see how this plays out. Yeah, this is a this is a definitely a, a high profile challenge for something that I feel like popped up and hadn't really been poked to date. So I feel like this is going to be a, definitely a test for this industry to see if it can survive long term. Let's talk about Kim Kardashian, though. So I would note that I'm one of those people who had said previously that like everything I've learned about the Kardashians is is has been against my will. And Kim and, and family, they're very polarizing. There's a lot of mm-hmm. uh, allegations of being famous just for being famous. But there's a lot more to that. And I feel like, Les, you got into uh, this story. And I'd love to hear kind of what you found about Kim's business skims. Yeah. So a few weeks ago, Kim and and her company, which she's a co-founder of Skims, made pretty big news because they raised their latest fundraising round of, I believe, $270 million, which brought the company up to a valuation of $4 billion, which regardless of how you feel about Kim Kardashian, is pretty impressive. For a four-year-old company that is predominantly direct to consumer, female founded, I mean, that's a pretty interesting accomplishment. And I wanted to learn a little bit more about why that is. And I was curious, why has this company been so successful, specifically during a time where we're seeing a lot of D2C companies really struggle? Yeah, before before you kind of get into that, I'm just kind of curious about this drop in that D2C space, because I feel like mm-hmm. there was a, a time where you can't scroll social media without seeing a Warby Parker ad. So I'm curious kind of Is there any reason why D2C just hasn't really held up? Yeah. You know, I think part of it is a lot of these brands were very, very niche specialty brands. I mean, how many companies have we heard of that kind of have the same origin story where XYZ founder is looking for a specific product? They could not find a millennial version that satisfied their needs. So they create a niche XYZ product and then VC gives them millions of dollars. And we heard that story over and over again with so many companies over the last decade where there might be a bit of buzz around the origins of a niche product. But how often are people really buying this and are they buying this over and over. And what we saw from a lot of these brands is they were relying really heavily on paid ads, paid ads on social media when they were really affordable. We had all of this data that we could hyper target those customers to get them interested in a product. But over the past few years, we've seen a lot of regulations change around data privacy, around what information companies can use in their targeting. And it's really cut into a lot of these businesses because that was what they were relying on for their marketing. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, so Skims clearly went a slightly different direction because they're not so heavily reliant on that paid ad for, you know, ac- acquiring customers. So kind of, I guess, the question is, what 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 did they do that was different? <laughs> I think what Skims has done really well from a marketing and, and just business perspective overall is they really haven't put all their eggs in one basket. I mean, Kim Kardashian has a huge following. She could be the marketing strategy for Skims and has enough influence if the company wanted to do that. But instead, the company has built really strong organic channels of its own. It has used different mediums such as social, email marketing. They've done a lot of really smart brand collaborations with other brands like Fendi, which is kind of unheard of for this really kind of high scale brand to work with an up and coming D2C brand. And they also have a really important retail partnership with Nordstrom, which I think has been a big key to their success. I mean, it's just really impressive. I feel like this is a company that's also up and up in sales. They're up another 50% from last year so far Mm -hmm. this year. Where where does this go? Does it just keep growing? It kind of seems like that's, it's unstoppable at this point. I mean, the rumors are that Skim's IPO is is likely what we could see coming in the next few years. And I wouldn't be surprised. I also wouldn't be surprised if Skim's expanded its retail footprint as well. And then I guess let, let's, this brings us back to the initial question here about, about Kim Kardashian and kind of has she beaten these allegations of being talentless? I know she went on Barbara Walters way back when and kind of got surprised with this real, really ultimately kind of mean question of like, what do you do? <laughs> you don't have talents. It seems like maybe she's turned the corner on that. You know, I think 
Kim Kardashian's greatest talent is her ability to sell. And I think that's also what makes her polarizing because she sometimes sells pretty polarizing things. Skims is not particularly polarizing, but the way she sells her image or her looks Mm -hmm. or her family and what happens in her family. I mean, the woman is always selling and... You know, regardless of how we feel, it's it's pretty effective. Yeah, I've always felt like Kim Kardashian's story was very, very interesting. I feel like most people became aware of her probably when she was young and hanging out with Paris Hilton. And of course, she had like a an adult tape come out. But her story kind of it it begins as like when I was a little kid and I mean like a child the biggest thing to ever happen on television was the OJ Simpson Bronco chase and like her dad was involved in that he was OJ Simpson's attorney so the way that she grew up was just so unlike the way most people grew up you know like you're surrounded by fame and scandal and your dad is on TV in the trial of the century nonstop every day And then you're young and you're hanging out with somebody who has a ton of money and is like famous for saying it's hot. And then you have this scandal about you and then your entire family is on TV all the time. Like she really never had like a normal life. And so it's interesting to see what she's done with it because you see a lot of people who grow up that way and they don't have to do anything. They just kind of like coast on their fame. And in a way she has done that, but she's also... She didn't have to become an entrepreneur, and she did, which is interesting to me. Yeah, I I agree. And we'll be really interested to see where this story goes. But that's, in fact, going to do it (laughs) for us today. Uh, I want to thank you for tuning in to the Hustle Daily Show. We're a proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Our editor today is Ezra Trupiano, and our executive producer is Darren Clark. We've got a lot more tech and business coverage in our newsletter. If you're not subscribed, go get yourself signed up at thehustle.co slash email. And if you want to hear more of Les's great marketing insights, uh, you can sign up for our new sibling newsletter, The Lead, which you can find also through our site. Thank you, everyone, and we'll catch you tomorrow. Hey, I want to tell you about another podcast brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. This one is called My First Million, hosted by Sam Parr and Sean Perry. My First Million features famous guests like Alice Hermosi, Sophia Amoruso, and Hassan Minaj sharing their secrets for how they made their first million and how to apply their learnings to capitalize on today's business trends and opportunities. So for example, in a recent episode, Sean discusses how his former intern went from making $30,000 a year to $40,000 in one minute by taking one big bet. And today, he's a 22-year-old millionaire thanks to a couple early investments. Want to know more? You can listen to My First Million wherever you get your podcasts.